As many of you know, I invest most of my money in a single global equity fund, but this is by no means the only way to invest. There are many alternative investments that have very good track records, and in this video we'll cover some of them. So how do we gauge those investments, what are their historic returns, and which ones do I think are most worthy of our consideration? This video is sponsored by Trading212, a UK commission-free investment platform. Before we move on to alternatives, let's discuss what makes a good strategy. So by strategy, I mean an investment strategy, of course, and here I'm thinking about three criteria which I think are very important. And the first one is simplicity. How complex is it to invest in this investment? Is it easy to understand? And I think a global index fund for stocks is easy to understand. But the alternatives I'll be discussing, some of them are more complex than others, but I think some of them are easy to understand. Secondly, is the strategy cheap? How expensive is it in order to buy the funds that give you exposure to an asset class? Some of them, as we'll see, are quite expensive relative to, say, a global stock fund. So really, you've got to do a kind of trade-off to think, is the additional return, diversification, whatever, worth it given this high fee? And then thirdly, I think a really important criterion is will this strategy work? Are you likely to be able to stick with it over decades? And for some strategies, they're very difficult to stick with. They're complex, they require a lot of work. And I think really you should be honest with yourself about whether you can stick with some of these investments, particularly as some of them are quite fickle and do have long periods of underperformance. So let's just bear in mind those three criteria as we go through this list of alternatives. And stepping back a bit, what is investment in the first place? Well, one way to think about it is that you're harvesting risk premium. What on earth does that mean? Well, when you invest your money, you're putting your capital at risk. Investments are crashy, and sometimes you'll have setbacks. And the reason why that's worth it in the long run is that in return for that risk, you'll be compensated with a premium above the risk-free rate, rather than just parking your money in short-term UK or US treasuries. Now, people often talk about the equity risk premium, the return above risk-free interest rates, but each of these investments that we'll look at also has its own risk premium. So try to think of investment generally as putting your capital at risk in various places and harvesting each of those risk premia. Now, Phil Huber has written this amazing book called The Allocator's Edge, where he has this beautiful diagram that shows many, many different types of investments and classifies them much like a periodic table. So, for example, if I invest in global equity funds, these are shown in the top right hand of the table. The letters you can see in the top left and the top right of each square are the primary objective of investing in that asset. So you can see that in the case of stocks, that primary objective is G, or growth, capital growth over the long term. Some investments also have a secondary objective, often something like diversification. And if we look in the bottom left of this table, you can see the various reasons why people invest in the first place. Some people invest for income. They want a steady stream of cash flows, often in retirement, such that they don't have to sell their investment in order to live. Or perhaps they don't need to take much risk. They're interested in capital preservation, in which case you just have to beat inflation long term. And of course, inflation protection is the reason why people invest in gold often. Sometimes you'll also think about diversification. How much does this asset diversify the rest of your investments, even though it might not have incredible returns itself? Is the investment illiquid, in which case you'd expect to earn an illiquidity premium? Private equity, for example, often falls into this category. And then finally, although it's strange to think of it in this way, tax efficiency is also a kind of premium. By not paying taxes, you're keeping some of that money, which goes on to compound over the long term. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that investment in stock indices is certainly not the only way to invest. And there was a brilliant spoof video by ARK Invest where they were making fun of index investing. And they certainly make some good points. Ask your advisor today if investing in a traditional broad-based index fund is suitable for you. A broad-based index provides investors with a feeling of safety and comfort knowing that they hold past success. 
And that's certainly true. If you look at the largest companies that make up global indices, they are the ones which have been historically successful. That's why their market cap is so big. So using that as our inspiration, let's look at some alternatives. I think the one which is most likely to work is something called factor investing. For starters, these are stock funds. So they simply slice up the equity universe slightly differently. Instead of thinking of countries, sectors, currencies, these ways of slicing up the market are according to investment style. So for example, you could go for cheap companies. That would be a value factor. And if you look at MSCI's website, they have a whole list of different factors for which they've constructed indices. So for the All Country World Index, for example, they have various different subtypes of index based on the investment factors. So they have minimum volatility, for example, which has low volatility stocks. They have high dividend yield stocks or quality, which is a factor we'll dig into in a moment. Momentum is another popular one. That's buying stocks which are rising rather than falling because that tends to be a trend that continues longer than it should. An equal weighted index weights each of the stocks in the index equally and tends to tilt towards small caps. Or maybe you want to go for growth as a style. That's been very successful over the last decade, for example. But all of these are just different ways of slicing up the space of stocks into styles and styles which have historically performed well. So I think once you get your head around these factor investing styles, I think they do satisfy our first criterion for a strategy. They are simple. You can see what's in the fund and the index company will tell you how they constructed the index. Secondly, now that these are fairly standardized, there are lots of trackers for each of these indices and the costs that you pay for them, although slightly higher than you'd pay for a regular index fund, are not egregiously expensive. The place where I think they fall down slightly is whether they're likely to work, simply because of our behavior. I think it's difficult to stick with some of these strategies. So for example, if we come back to that factor which has done very well historically, which is value, where you buy cheap stocks, that's a factor that's performed incredibly well for a very long period of time. In fact, if we use pharma French data, which goes all the way back to 1926, you can see that this style of investing, buying cheap stocks in the US, worked for 80 years. Not perfectly, of course, it did have setbacks, but since 2006, there's just been one massive setback and value investors have really suffered as a result. Growth has been the opposite style of investment, which has done well since 2006. Maybe that's because interest rates were super low for super long, but whatever the reason, it has been a very difficult style of investment to stick with. So I think in order to succeed with factor funds, you've got to find one that you're comfortable with and one that you understand and which you feel is intuitive. Personally, I think that quality is one that I understand and which I probably could stick with long term. The way these are constructed, in the case of MSCI at least, is to say they have to have a good return on equity. So the amount of profits generated divided by the amount of equity that the company has has to be large. Those profits have to be steadily increasing over time. And also there mustn't be too much leverage on the company's balance sheet not too much borrowings, which puts the company at risk. So by filtering for stocks that satisfy those three criteria, MSCI has constructed sub-indices for all of its indices. So if we look at MSCI World and MSCI USA, both of them have a quality sub-index. And the effect of that filter, certainly since 1975, for which I've got data, the effect has been to increase return, and in the case of MSCI World, to reduce the volatility. So lower risk, higher return. Also, I think this is an intuitive strategy. Of course, we'd like to own stocks which are fundamentally strong. But also, if you look at something like the ULSA index, which measures the depth and length of crashes relative to the previous all-time high, these quality filters tend to improve the ULSA index. Less ulcers in investment is generally a good thing. But really, you've got to find what factors you think you'd be most comfortable with and also that you could stick with long term. Today's video is sponsored by Trading212, a commission-free investment platform here in the UK. I've been using it for some time to manage my fund portfolio. So I've got an ISA on their platform 
where I don't pay commission fees, I don't pay a platform fee, and if I've got cash in my account, interest is paid on a daily basis. As I make this video, the rate of interest I get is 5.2%. Furthermore, I can use that cash anytime. So if I want to invest it in a fund, say, it's available immediately. And of course, because it's an ISA, I can withdraw the cash at any time if I want to. And also, if you opened a new ISA on the Trading212 platform between January the 29th, 2024, and April the 30th, 2024, you'll be eligible for the ISA cashback scheme, where you get 1% cashback for any money that you put into your ISA. So that's up to a limit of £200. There are certain terms and conditions for that. You have to have opened a Trading212 ISA for the first time. You have to be a UK resident, age 18 and above. You have to have activated the ISA between that January and April date, 2024 and you have to have an active Trading212 Invest account. They also have lots of great features like their Pi feature, which I've been using a lot recently with my Value Quality Momentum UK Stock Fund. You can also publish your Pies so that other people can see them and also take inspiration from other people's Pies, which have already been published. And as a viewer of Pension Craft, you get a special offer from Trading212 where you can claim a free share, a fractional share worth up to £100. In order to claim that, create and verify a new Trading212 account, make a minimum deposit into the account, and use the promo code, which is my first name, Romin, R-A-M-I-N. And you'll also find a link to that in the description below. Another way to think about alternatives is in terms of alpha and beta. So if you're not familiar with it, alpha is the outperformance relative to a global index, say, and beta is the simple act of tracking that index. Beta is usually cheap, all you're doing is tracking an index, and alpha tends to be expensive because you're paying experts to try and do something really hard, which is to beat an index. However, there's this beautiful graph, again taken from Phil Huber's book, but actually quoting research from AQR, which shows how gradually over time, alpha strategies, these are clever strategies thought up by active managers, become beta, or as they put it, alpha is just undiscovered beta. So for example, if you've got value investors, traditionally these would be active managers who'd find these value stocks and then you'd buy their fund. However, people realised that you could just automate the process and apply certain mechanical criteria to stocks and that way produce a passive index which you could track very cheaply. You don't have to pay an active manager a huge sum to do that, you can do it in an almost industrialised process. So what used to be yesterday's alpha becomes tomorrow's beta, and that means that it's cheaper for us to buy. So as investors, this transformation process is a good one. Factor investing, for example, is now pretty cheap because there are standard indices which MSCI produces, which are tracked by multiple asset managers. And maybe we're moving to a future where other sources of alpha, maybe hedge fund alpha, will get turned into something which is packaged up, which we can buy very cheaply. But certainly the statistics don't look good for active managers. If you've never come across it, the S&P Index versus Active Report, produced by S&P Global Indices, is a really insightful report which tracks the performance of active managers and looks at the percentage of them which are beaten by a passive index. So for example, here you can see that in the US over a 15 year period, 88% of active managers were beaten by their S&P index. And it's not just the US where we see this, it's almost every country in the world. The same is true of Canada, the success rate was even lower there. It's true of Europe, 93% of active managers were beaten by a European stock index. But it's also true in emerging markets where you might expect there would be a little bit of outperformance because these are less liquid markets. However, as we can see in Mexico, that's not the case nor in Brazil, nor in Chile, MENA, South Africa, or India. There's also a claim that during bear markets, when there's a crash in stocks, active managers can choose the stocks which won't crash as much, and they can outperform that way. The evidence from Spiva shows that wasn't the case in recent big crashes. It wasn't true in 2008, and it wasn't true in 2001. So I don't think active investment is the way to go when it comes to allocating capital. However, for some alternative investments, you don't really have a choice whether to go passive. 
So for example, in private equity, almost all private equity funds will be actively managed. These are private capital. So these will be illiquid investments often, which aren't available to retail investors such as you and I. These funds are also often quite opaque and they have very high management fees and they may not even be available to retail investors. They are popular, however, because they don't seem to be very volatile. For example, you may just find out the value of the fund every six months or every year. They are popular with pension funds, but I think this may be an example of volatility laundering. Just because you don't see the volatility, you think the risk isn't there, but of course it is. And because these are opaque funds, it's often difficult to get track records for the fund itself. It depends very much on the fund manager. But certainly for these private equity investments, the premium you're earning is illiquidity. These are often illiquid investments and you should earn a premium for them. Hedge funds are also not available to most retail investors. I've heard Clifford Asnes describe them in a beautiful way, which is to say that they're funds for rich people in Geneva managed by rich people in Connecticut. But hedge funds tend to be quite opaque, like private equity funds, so they cross off the simplicity box. They also cross off the cheap box because usually the fees are high because you really are trying to find the best managers and they have to be compensated well. Real estate, in the form of commercial real estate, you can buy with real estate investment trusts. These also could be illiquid, so you will get some illiquidity premium. They tend to favour income. And I've also made many videos about REITs in the past, but they are high risk investments. They tend to have the same volatility as stocks, but they do have their own sub indices. So it is a world unto itself with multiple sectors. For example, offices at the moment are not particularly popular because of the way we've changed our behavior after the pandemic. Not as many of us work in offices, so the demand for office space has collapsed, whereas things like data centers are in big demand. So really be careful about the sectors if you are going to invest in REITs and realize it's not a safe investment. It's as volatile as equity, if not more so. And then finally, commodities are very much an inflation play usually, but also a diversification play. So if we go back to that Phil Huber periodic table of investments, you'll see that the two reasons why you invest in commodities would be inflation protection and secondly, to diversify your equity holdings. Another way of investing in commodities is via miners. So these are the companies which dig up the commodities. They do provide a risk premium, whereas commodities don't provide an income. These miners will pay usually a high dividend. And they also provide that steady long term increase in price, which we'd expect with stocks, the equity risk premium. However, they also come with their own crashiness, and that's because they are stocks. Just because you buy a gold miner, doesn't mean that its stock price won't crash when all other stocks are crashing. So the diversification benefit is reduced, but you do get that equity risk premium. And as an example of something that was only available to sophisticated investors previously, return stacking is now available in fund form, at least in the US. The idea behind return stacking is let's say you want to get equity exposure. One way to do that is simply to buy a global index fund. So say you've got £100, you could just buy £100 of Global Index Tracker, or you could buy a two times levered index tracker and only have to invest £50 to get the same exposure. But then what happens is you've got £50 left over and you can invest that in another source of risk premium, ideally one which is uncorrelated with the equity market. So for example, in the US, the way this pre-packaged return stacking ETF works is that it buys a leveraged equity exposure, but then it uses the leftover capital to invest in things called CTA funds. These are funds which can go long and short via the futures market and which historically have been uncorrelated with stocks. So in the fact sheet in the bottom section here, you can see that the strategy will invest using a trend following strategies in futures contracts among four major asset classes commodities, currencies, equities, and fixed income. So it's early days for this fund. It hasn't been around for long, but it does look like it's working in its main goal, which is to generate that equity risk premium and also to outperform a bit because it has these extra sources of risk premium, which have been stacked on top. Don't bother looking for this if you're in the UK, by the way, 
it isn't available to UK investors. A final source of premium is you. And I think if you run your own business, that's one way in which you can generate outperformance. Now, depending on your business, it could be simple. It might satisfy that criterion, although let's face it, our own business seldom is simple. It's never cheap, so it's unlikely to be something which doesn't require a lot of your capital, a lot of your time. It can be a side hustle, for example, in which case you can minimise the use of your time, but you can't exclude it altogether, of course. And then the probability of success is another place where this one falls down. Most businesses fail after about five years. The success rate in the UK, for example, is around 40% over a five-year period. But even if your business fails, I think it's still a worthwhile enterprise because it'll build up your skills and also it may be successful before it folds. All I would say is that you will pay the price. I know from personal experience that it takes a lot out of you to run your own business. And if you have a family, for example, you're going to have to sacrifice some of that time with your family in order to build the business. But if it is successful, I think this is a great source of capital, which you can then invest in future. So I don't think there is a one size fits all investment for everybody. And I think it's good to consider these alternatives because it may be that one of these alternatives could be appropriate for you. All I'd say is use those three criteria. Is it simple and do you understand it? Is it cheap? And also, is it likely to succeed as a strategy? Can you stick with it? And if it does satisfy those three criteria, then why not go for it? Why not try it out at least? Don't do it in huge size initially, maybe, but certainly consider it as part of your investment strategy. Now, don't forget our offer from Trading212. If you create a new account with Trading212, fund it, verify it, and use the promo code, which is my name, Roman, then you can be eligible to earn a free share, a fractional share, worth up to £100. And, as always, thank you for listening.